Hi everyone and welcome back to Minds and Machines with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. So today what we're going to be doing is very, very briefly wrapping up Lemaitre's Man a Machine. So this is Man a Machine Part 2. Now, um, a quick bit of recap. Remember that last time uh, we started out by talking a little bit about Lemaitre himself. Who was he? He was a materialist philosopher and he was also a physician. And he was also a little bit of a hedonist. Um, he, apparently, the story goes, developed a, a gastrointestinal problem after uh, engaging in a bit of uh, Epicurean gluttony at a banquet held by the um, uh, French ambassador to Prussia. So, uh, a bit of a hedonist, definitely a materialist, also a physician. Um, and what we did last time was just take a brief look at some interesting uh, passages from Man Machine that captured his mechanistic view of the human being. Um, a little bit, uh, a few of the pas uh, passages kind of captured his hedonistic outlook. We certainly got a sense of his provocative uh, writing style. Uh, in fact, that's what we started with. The first passage we looked at was quite provocative, and Lemaitre continues in that style throughout this work. Um, and we talked um, a little bit about uh, non-human animal intelligence. Remember, Lemaitre, contrary to Descartes, says that man and animals, or human beings and non-human animals, I should say, are both machines. They are, these, all of these creatures are machines. They are machines with souls, so they're not soulless automatons. That is, animals are not soulless automatons, as Descartes believed. That's what we looked at last time. Today, because we are very behind and I need to catch up, we are just going to briefly examine some more interesting passages. I'm going to talk a little bit about imagination and reason first. Then we'll move on to talk about um, natural law and morality. And that's probably what we'll spend the most time on today. Um, we'll bring this back to non-human animals as well as we do this, as we engage with what Lemaitre has to say about morality, natural law, and so forth. And then we'll wrap it up by just um, taking a look at uh, how Lemaitre wraps his book up. Uh, he comes back to the nature of the human being, uh, and of the animal for that matter. What are these creatures? They're machines with souls. Okay, so let's get started with a little bit of talk about the imagination. All right, let's go. So the imagination, I mean, nowadays we use this term maybe a bit too loosely um, in non-technical circles, I mean. You know, we can imagine uh, scenes in our mind, visual scenes, but we can also imagine sounds and smells. Um, imagination in the colloquial sense, and probably often in the technical sense, is not limited to uh, mental imagery, which is, you know, where the word comes from. Imagination, image, you know. Um, these philosophers, philosophers like Lemaitre, like Descartes, like Hobbes, do tend to talk about the imagination uh, specifically in terms of mental imagery. Um, and they treat it often as separate... Uh, from other parts of the intellect or, or, or parts of the soul, right? Uh, Lemaitre doesn't do that. Lemaitre says this of the imagination. He says, I always use the word imagine because I think that everything is the work of imagination and that all the faculties of the soul can be cor correctly reduced to pure imagination in which they all consist. Thus judgment, reason, and memory are not absolute parts of the soul but merely modifications of this kind of medullary screen upon which images of the objects painted in the eye are projected as by a magic lantern. So this is interesting on the one hand, uh, because Lemaitre is treating um, the imagination as the kind of uh, primary thing that the intellect does, and everything else, judgment, reasoning, remembering, um, is, is a modification of that. How do we get to be able to do that? Well, uh, Lemaitre thinks it's primarily by education. Um, and this can be formal education, but also just a sort of natural education, right? Like a child learning that uh, she shouldn't touch the hot stove because she'll get burned, right? So Lemaitre is talking about this kind of thing. Through education, uh, the imagination actually... Um, 
kind of becomes able to do more than merely imagine. We're able to start to reason, uh, to judge, to remember things, to recollect things, right? So I think this is interesting for that reason, but it's also a little bit problematic. Um, so I, the one reason I wanted to bring this up was because of this interesting idea about reason and the imagination. Reasoning is one of the things that we can do with our imagination with education, if we are educated, right? That's what Lemaitre says. That's the interesting part. That's the one reason I wanted to talk about it. But the other reason I wanted to talk about this is because it actually raises a couple of interesting problems. And these are problems which are still talked about in the philosophy of mind. And that's why I've added this emphasis here, uh, this last sentence. Uh, Thus, judgment, reason, and memory are not absolute parts of the soul, but merely modifications of this kind of medullary screen upon which images of the objects painted in the eye are projected as by a magic lantern. Why is this problematic, you ask? Well, um, it kind of uh, gives us a picture of the mind as if, you know, it's like a theater, right? Uh, stuff comes in through the eyes and is projected onto this medullary screen somewhere in the brain, you know? And this is suggestive of a problematic idea that Daniel Dennett, who we will look at later on in the course, calls the Cartesian theater. What is the Cartesian theater? Well, firstly, I should say, and this should be clear if you've been following along with the readings and the lectures, that Lemaitre was no Cartesian, right? He was not a dualist. He didn't believe there were two distinct substances, a uh, thinking substance and extended substance. Um, so Lemaitre was not a Cartesian, but he's still talking about um, the imagination or for our purposes, I guess, consciousness, because this is consciousness is the context in which Dennett raises this problem. This suggests that there's a special place in the brain where everything kind of comes together, and that there's a Cartesian sort of self who um, is watching the experience, the, imag the imagining, the conscious experience, whatever. It suggests that there's like a Cartesian self in there somewhere, watching all of this on a screen. That's problematic, uh, because that raises a further issue called the homunculus problem. So on the one hand, this is problematic because this sounds a lot like the Cartesian theater problem. Dennett calls it the Cartesian theater not because Descartes actually advocated anything like this, um, but it's just meant to capture this problematic idea of there being um, some kind of screen or stage where conscious experience or imaginings or whatever happen in the brain. There's nothing to suggest that um, this is actually how it works based on modern neuroscientific findings. In fact, um, there, 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 there may not be a special place in the brain. There's probably um, a lot of different places in the brain all interacting together to produce our conscious experience or to produce uh, an imagining of some kind, right? Uh, but we can talk about that later in the course, perhaps, if perhaps we talk about uh, consciousness for one of our special topics. I don't know. So anyway, uh, the Cartesian theater is problematic, but it's also problematic because, you know, who is watching the screen? If, <laughs> if uh, the images are coming in uh, through the eyes and being projected onto some medullary screen, who is watching this screen? Who's seeing this screen? Is it another uh, you? Is it is it just yourself? Okay, but how does that self see what's on the screen? Does that little person, or in Latin, homunculus, have a screen in their head with another little person watching that screen? And this is the homunculus problem. This is why this is problematic. This leads to what we call an infinite regress. We don't actually explain anything by appealing to this self in the brain somewhere, watching this Cartesian theater or this medullary screen. It's just uh, homunculi all the way down, if you catch my drift. So I think what Lemaitre has to say about the imagination is interesting, but it's also a little bit problematic. I like that he says reason is just something we can do with our imagination. But as far as the imagination actually works, uh, you know, he describes it in a problematic way, in a Cartesian theater kind of way. I think that's what Daniel Dennett would say about this. And of course, he raises the 
homunculus problem as well. And it's good to know about the homunculus problem. If you ever go on to study uh, something like consciousness studies, uh, the homunculus problem will come up again, I'm sure, in the course of your studies. So it's good to know about. Anyway, um, that's all I'm going to say about imagination for now. We'll probably come back to imagination when we talk about natural law and whether animals have this. So let's move on and talk about natural law now. So as a little bit of a segue into his discussion about natural law, uh, Lemaitre asks, what makes humans special, right? If we are special, what makes us good at thinking using reason? What makes us capable of knowing the difference between right and wrong? You know, what is it that allows us to say that we have a conscience or some kind of moral center? Well, um, Lemaitre thinks that it's because we've got ourselves a really good machine, right? Nature or God, whichever, has created a being that possesses reason and morality by virtue of, um, you know, things like our imagination, our capacities to experience pleasure and pain. Um, and we can do these things because we have or we are the kind of natural machine um, that has these capabilities, right? That's why he says on page 109 that man's preeminent advantage is his organism. We are the kinds of organisms that have imagination and the capacity to experience pleasure and pain. And with a little education, we can do things like reason and, um, you know, live good lives, virtuous lives and that kind of thing. On um, page 110, Lemaitre says, <clears throat> but if the brain is at the same time well organized and well educated, it is a fertile soil, well sown, that brings forth a hundredfold what it has received, or to leave the figures of speech often needed to express what one means and to grace uh, to truth itself, the imagination raised by art to the rare and beautiful dignity of genius apprehends exactly all the relations of the ideas it has conceived, and takes in easily an astounding number of objects in order to deduce from them a long chain of consequences, which are again but new relations produced by a comparison with the first, to which the soul finds a perfect resemblance. Here, Lemaitre is saying a little bit about how he thinks um, the imagination, with some education as well, allows us to reason about things, to make comparisons uh, between different things, to learn by experience, essentially. I mean, remember, Lemaitre is an empiricist. So what about animals, though? Are we really special? Um, Lemaitre kind of thinks so in a certain respect, but also he doesn't think there is um, as big a difference between humans and non-human animals as most thinkers at the time, certainly thinkers like Descartes, thought. Um, he writes, for example, on page 113, In spite of all these advantages of man over animals, it is doing him honor to place him in the same class. It is doing humankind an honor to say that humans are animals, in other words. To continue, For truly, up to a certain age, he is more of an animal than they, since at birth he has less instinct. What animal would die of hunger in the midst of a river of milk? Man alone. So um, we are basically animals. And moreover, um, we're very vulnerable in our early stages of life. I mean, think of when you're watching, uh, you know, David Attenborough, Planet Earth, right? See a baby gazelle on the savanna. It's born. And it's walking minutes later. And then before you know it, it, it can run away from predators with the rest of its herd. Uh, humans can't do anything like this, you know. Humans can't um, crawl or walk right away, let alone speak or do anything uh, that we feel is what sets us apart from animals. So that's what Lemaitre is saying here. And what is the difference, really, ultimately, between man and animals, or humans and animals? Well, it seems to be a matter of education. Humans can educate themselves. Animals uh, don't. He says of animals on page 114, Animals frankly glory in being cynics. Without education, they are without prejudices. 
For one more example, let us observe a dog and a child who have lost their master on a highway. The child cries and does not know what's, to what saint to pray, while the dog, better helped by means of, or sorry, better helped by his sense of smell than the child by his reason, soon finds his master. So, you know, um, animals, uh, not inferior to humans, uh, just different. And one of the important differences is that we have education. This little bit about animals glorying and being cynics is, um, you know, uh, Lemaitre doesn't mean cynicism in the colloquial sense, like, oh, that dog over there is so cynical. No, he doesn't mean that. Um, uh, cynicism is a school of philosophy that goes back to Diogenes, an ancient Greek thinker. Um, and it comes from the Greek word kunos, which is um, the root of our word for canine. So to be a cynic was to be like a dog. What does that mean? For Diogenes... It meant, um, well, scratch yourself when you have an itch, eat when you're hungry, um, do whatever you want. I mean, Diogenes was a very interesting fellow by all accounts. Um, he uh, lived in, um, you know, he lived kind of like a homeless person, right? Um, there are many, many interesting, um, interesting tales you can read about him. Often he would live in uh, these big wine barrels. The ancient Greeks would uh, have these massive barrels for their wine, much bigger than the barrels you probably think of when I say barrel. Diogenes lived in one of these. Um, Diogenes would often masturbate in public. When people would call him out on this, um, he would say like, oh, come on, but think about when you're hungry. Wouldn't it be great if you could just cure your hunger by rubbing your stomach? Hey, obviously not very appropriate, but mm, that's Diogenes for you. Another story uh, of Diogenes, he was visiting a wealthy man's house, and um, Diogenes was uh, known for being very lewd, you know, being the public masturbating homeless person that he was. Um, and he used to spit in public and relieve himself in public, you know, like a dog. Um, so this wealthy person says, look, Diogenes, I have a lot of nice things in my house. Please don't spit on any of them. So Diogenes spits in his face instead. Perhaps the best uh, known tale about Diogenes is um, Alexander the Great. None other than Alexander the Great comes to look Diogenes up because he's heard about this cynic philosopher. Um, and, you know, this is Alexander the Great, kind of a big deal. Goes up to Diogenes and says, Hey, Diogenes, it's a pleasure to meet you. Can I get you anything? And what does Diogenes say to Alexander the Great? Yeah, move over. You're blocking the sun. So that's kind of what um, Lemaitre is talking about by referencing cynicism here. He's talking about cynicism in the philosophical sense. Uh, the sort of um, idea that you should just live a bit like a dog does. Um, so, uh, just to explain, uh, way too long of a digression on Diogenes there, but um, yeah, interesting figure, I, I guess, is probably one of the kinder things we can say about him. Oh, uh, animals and morality. Okay, here we go. We're getting, we're getting to the natural law stuff. This is one of the differences between uh, humans and animals uh, that, at least according to the theologians and the philosophers that Lemaitre is talking about, this is one of those key differences, you know, that makes humans special and animals not special. Humans have morality. We understand right and wrong. We have natural law, right? This idea of natural law is that, you know, right and wrong are, you know... Uh, kind of determined by God or nature, right? Um, that's what Lemaitre means by natural law. But Lemaitre thinks that animals understand natural law just in perhaps a more rudimentary sense than humans do. He says on page 115, for example, in order to decide whether animals which do not talk have received the natural law, we must therefore have recourse to those signs to which I have just referred, if any such exist. The facts seem to prove it. A dog that bit the master who was teasing it seemed to repent a minute afterwards. It looked sad, ashamed, afraid to show itself, and seemed to confess its guilt by a crouching and downcast air. Now, you might say, 
oh, we're just anthropomorphizing here. You know, what if you know, you can look up viral pet videos of dogs looking guilty when they've done something wrong, right? Um, are we merely anthropomorphizing these dogs? Well, I don't think it's that unreasonable to, to say that a dog experiences some kind of dog form of guilt. Dogs are, after all, social animals. And emotions, um, particularly moral emotions like guilt and shame and anger and these kinds of things, are important for regulating social interactions. And that goes for human and non-human animals as well. So I don't think it's that crazy to say um, the dog feels guilty or ashamed. Obviously not in as sophisticated a sense as humans do, but in, in its own kind of rudimentary dog way, right? So, yeah, I, I think I agree with Lemaitre here. He continues on page 117, talking about animals again. Uh, Would its soul, which feeds the same joys, the same mortification and the same discomfiture which we feel, remain utterly unmoved by disgust when it saw a fellow creature torn to bits, or when it had itself pitilessly, uh, pit pitilessly excuse me, dismembered by this fellow creature? If this be granted, it follows that the precious gift now in question, natural law, uh, precious gift to humanity, uh, would not have been denied to animals. For since they show us sure signs of repentance, as well as of intelligence, what is there absurd in thinking that beings, almost as perfect machines as ourselves, our, are like us, made to understand and to feel nature? So, animals are not as sophisticated as us, but if they were, they would certainly understand the natural law in the same way that we do. And even though they're not as sophisticated as we do, there is actually behavioral evidence that they do understand natural law. And, you know, Lemaitre is a bit of a, 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 you know, he's ahead of his time here talking about animals. But just think forward to the early 20th century when we're talking about behaviorism again. Remember, we talked about behaviorism in our first lecture. And behaviorists thought that we couldn't say anything about the mind. Um, we could only talk about behavior. Here's Lemaitre using behavior to talk about um, what animals think about right and wrong and what they feel about right and wrong, more importantly. Very interesting. And you know, one thing that bears mentioning, of course, is that human beings are not perfectly moral at all, right? This should come as no surprise to anybody. Uh, Lemaitre says on page 117, for example, Let no one object that animals, for the most part, are savage beasts, incapable of realizing the evil that they do. For do all men discriminate better between vice and virtue? There is ferocity in our species, as well as in theirs. So Lemaitre is saying, yeah, I know animals are savage beasts, but so are we, frankly. Um, just think back to those uh, English eating their red meat, rare and bloody. Mm -hmm. So basically what Lemaitre is kind of arguing through this section is that if animals do not possess an understanding of the natural law, then neither do most people. Um, that's something you'd have to grant. Um, what is natural law anyway for Lemaitre? I described it earlier. Natural law is this sort of... Um, uh, divinely established uh, right and wrong, this divinely established morality, uh, sort of like if morality is a natural thing. Um, but Lemaitre gets a little bit more specific than that. And if you read behind the, uh, read between the lines here, you can actually see that he's talking about a kind of ethical hedonism, right? Remember, Lemaitre was a hedonism. And if you're a hedonist, there are many different types of hedonism, but if you're a hedonist, uh, what you're all about is, um, you know, pleasure, hedone, as the ancient Greeks said. You want uh, pleasure, and pleasure here means like aesthetic pleasure, emotional pleasure, so like happiness, the company of your friends, uh, love from your partner and your family, you know, this kind of thing, right? Um, so ethical hedonism, what is that? Well, on ethical hedonism, Basically, the things um, which make us feel pleasure or happiness are the only things that are intrinsically good. Uh, things that feel bad, like pain, displeasure, are things that are intrinsically bad or intrinsically evil. 
Um, and if you combine this view with a little bit of compassion or uh, what's sometimes called fellow feeling or nowadays what we might call sympathy or empathy, what you get is a kind of natural law that sounds a lot like the golden rule that we find in a lot of the world's major religions. In Christianity, it's, uh, you know, do unto others as you would be done by. Um, don't do anything to someone else that you wouldn't want to have done to you. Why? Well, you know it would feel bad if it was done to you. So don't do it to them. But do things for other people that would make you feel good, right? This is the kind of natural law that uh, Lemaitre seems to be talking about here. It's a kind of ethical hedonism. And that's why I think it was important to mention that he was a hedonist. Not just because, uh, you know, the story behind the way he died, but his hedonism also fits into his, uh, his ethics. Um, and we can kind of tease this out by giving uh, Lemaitre an exegetical reading here. All right. Oh, um, this, is, this actually gets fleshed out in uh, these other quotes here on page 121 and 122. should take a look here where he writes, Nature has created us all solely to be happy. Yes, all of us, from the crawling worm to the eagle lost in the clouds. For this cause she has given all animals some share of natural law, a share greater or less according to the needs of each animal's organs when in normal condition. So there you go. Um, nature has kind of given humans and non-human animals this, um, this natural law by virtue of uh, the way their bodies are organized, which allows them to feel and to imagine, albeit in perhaps a more limited extent when compared to humans. So, um, <clears throat> and, and, and here on the same page, he, he kind of defines natural law just like we just defined it. Um, quote, now, how shall we define natural law? It is a feeling that teaches us what we should not do because we would not wish it to be done to us. There you go. It's pretty much the golden rule. Now, do animals have this? Of course they do, Lemaitre says. He says on page 121, continuing to 122, you see that natural law is but an intimate feeling that, like all other feelings, thought included, belongs also to imagination. Evidently, therefore, natural law does not presuppose education, revelation, nor legislation, provided one does not propose to confuse natural law with civil laws in the ridiculous fashion of the theologians. Here he is being provocative again. Um, uh, the theologians are saying natural law, only humans have that, and that's what makes us special. But Lemaitre is saying what they're actually talking about is civil laws, you know, uh, laws that we come up with, like the social contract kind of laws that Hobbes was talking about in the Leviathan, right? Natural law being a feeling belongs to the imagination and uh, animals by virtue of the assembly of their organism have this, right? So Lemaitre is saying, of course, animals can have natural law. You don't need to be educated to have natural law. It's natural law. It's natural. We are built this way by nature or by God, depending on what you believe. Well, before we wrap it up, I guess we've got to talk a little bit about the soul, um, because this is minds and machines, and so many philosophers have treated the mind or the intellect and the soul as the same thing. So what does Lemaitre say about the soul? Well, well, on page 128, he says, The soul is therefore but an empty word of which no one has any idea, and which an enlightened man should use only to signify the part in us that thinks. Given the least principle of motion, animated bodies will have all that is necessary for moving, feeling, thinking, repenting, or in a word for conducting themselves in the physical realm and in the, mor mor bleh, bleh, in the moral realm, which depends on it. So, there's a bit of a similarity with Aristotle here, don't you think? Um, and, and I think this is very interesting because, I mean, Lemaitre's not an Aristotelian. He is a physician. And Aristotle was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, also had some medical training. His father, Nicomachus, was a physician uh, to the king of Macedonia. And one thing I can say for certain about Aristotle is that he was a zoologist. In fact, he was the first zoologist. 
um, after parting ways with Plato, he spent a lot of time studying the natural world and, you know, vivisecting all the creatures he found. Hmm. Anyway, I think, I think it's just interesting because, um, you know, there are parallels between Aristotle and Lemaitre here in the sense that they're all about um, the, you know, the soul being able, being, it, being what it is by virtue of the organization and function of the organism, right? Um, uh, Lemaitre doesn't uh, have the, uh, this idea of a tripartite soul like Aristotle did, but there are some interesting parallels there. And that's probably because both of these thinkers were very empiricist, right? That's what I think. A couple of other things you should take a look at following this, if you want, um, is Lemaitre's list of mechanistic functions of the body on page 129 to 131 or so. He talks about, um, you know, for example, muscles that are separated from the body. If they are stimulated, they will move. Um, uh, if you um, apply heat to the flesh of certain uh, dead fish, they'll flap around as if they're swimming. Um, if a frog's heart is stimulated, it will be, you know, um, things like this. Um, uh, things where after life has ended, um, bodily machinery keeps on ticking, right? I think he even mentions being guillotined um, as well. You know, there are some pretty horrific stories of um, people being guillotined where, um, you know, the head just doesn't lifelessly drop off. Uh, it um, struggles to, I don't know, perhaps scream for uh, a while after it's been severed. Um, kind of like um, how uh, a chicken's body might run and flap around if its head is severed. So, uh, yeah, very morbid, very gross, but uh, very mechanical. So take a look at that list if you have the stomach for it. What does he say, finally, about the human being? Well, on page 143 and 44, Lemaitre says, To be a machine, to feel, to think, to know how to distinguish good from, e good from bad, as well as blue from yellow, in a word, to be born with an intelligence and a sure moral instinct, and to be but an animal, are therefore characters which are no more contradictory than to be an ape or a parent and be able to give oneself pleasure. I believe that thought is so little incompatible with organized matter that it seems to be one of its properties on a par with electricity, the faculty of motion, impenetrability, extension, etc., very, very materialist here, and also a lot like Aristotle, once again. What is the soul? The soul is something we have in, by virtue of our body's organization, and that includes the brain. The part in us that thinks can do what it does, because the matter that we're made of, all this water and carbon and everything, this meat machine in our brain, or in our skull, is organized such that we can think and that we know right from wrong. So we are machines, essentially. And so Lemaitre closes by saying on page 148, 149, Let us then conclude boldly that man is a machine, and that in the whole universe there is but a single substance differently modified. This is no hypothesis set forth by dint of a number of postulates and assumptions. It is not the work of prejudice, nor even my reason alone. Ooh, shady. I should have disdained a guide which I think to be so untrustworthy, had not my senses, bearing a torch, so to speak, induced me to follow reason by lighting the way themselves. Experience has thus spoken to me in behalf of reason, and in this way I have combined the two. So here we get another big uh, blast of materialism, right? Uh, there is there is but a single substance, infinitely or different, differently modified. There's only one substance, physical stuff, matter. He's a materialist. He's a physicalist, and knowledge uh, of this for Lemaitre does not come from reason alone. You do need to use reason, but you've got to rely on your senses as well. So we get a good look at Lemaitre's empiricism here too, as well as his materialism. All right, so that's it for Lemaitre on the human being. So, today we finished up our examination of Man and Machine by Lemaitre. Uh, today we talked a little bit about the imagination and reason. Um, I, I told you all about the Cartesian theater and the homunculus problem, or the homunculus fallacy. 
Um, and then we talked a little bit about imagination, imagination and re reason as we explored natural law and did a little more comparison between humans and non-human animals. Um, again, um, in the previous lecture, I linked a bunch of videos in the video description, all which give really striking examples of non-human animal intelligence. And if you're interested in uh, non-human animal morality, let me know. I have some interesting papers which you might like to take a look at. Uh, and then finally, we wrapped up by, you know, just taking a look at what Lemaitre has to say about uh, the soul and the human being. We are a machine that thinks. Um, uh, and so are animals, for that matter. So unlike Descartes, we are not this machine body with a soul that thinks, and this soul is us. The soul is you, the self. No, Lemaitre doesn't think that at all. It's much more Aristotelian. The organized matter that we're made of, that our machine selves are made of, that is what gives rise to the soul. That is what our soul is. So, next time, we're going to be jumping forward in time all the way to the 20th century. So I'd like you to please read Computing Machinery and Intelligence by Alan Turing. Uh, for our next two lectures, we're going to discuss Turing machines. We talked a little bit about Turing machines um, in my first proper lecture. So I'm going to give a recap of that because this is the means by which Alan Turing formalized a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about up until now. You know, what is thinking? Reasoning. Alan Turing formalizes it all as computation using the notion of a Turing machine. And we're also going to get to discuss probably one of my favorite topics, indeed the topic I wrote my PhD thesis on, uh, we are going to be discussing the imitation game, or as it's come to be known now, the Turing test. And this is Turing's operationalist test of whether a machine can be said to think. And it's a lot like what Descartes proposes in the discourses, which we briefly looked at in a previous lecture. So that's what we'll be looking at next time. I'm so sorry this lecture was so late. Um, I should be caught up this week. I know I've said that before, but um, since I'm probably especially familiar with Turing's work. It shouldn't be a problem to crank those lectures out and get them to you in no time at all. So uh, that said, let me know if you have any questions, um, and I will see you all next time when we'll begin talking about Alan Turing and his Turing machines and the Turing test. Okay, bye for now, everybody. <laughs>